over the years, we have had the chance to rethink what it means to design for the high density housing. And we've been lucky to have projects in different locations of different budgets to test those ideas. Um, the concerns that we have are universal concerns, concerns of people living in apartment that's true to everybody, no matter where you are. Light and air is required for wellness. Spatial plasticity, meaning think about living in a volume rather than a space only. And of course, integration in nature. Nature creates wellness. And you can see from this uh, summary of these 10 projects, over a period of 20 years, there's been a consist consistency in the way of thinking about design and how we put buildings together. I start designing not just with plans. When, when a project comes with requirements, not just with plans, but to start to think about volumes. And all those diagrams show that I think about apartments volumetrically. So instead of just two dimension, spaces can have double height. It can have exterior space that are double height and it opens up a flexibility of design. My first project given to me for high rise was in 1999. It was a 36 story building. And my second project uh, three years later in Malaysia, um, I really used that project to distill. It was a very important moment in my career to have this high rise project. So I thought upon the idea that we were given small apartments to design and I questioned why not a small apartment of 500 square feet or 50 square meters why can't it have a high living and dining space? And in order to create efficiency, I thought of the units as being able to stack, as in the diagram. I will not repeat too much about the diagram, but every project I introduced will have a diagram that would show the relationship. Uh, in 2002, the same opportunity of a site that has a view to one KLCC park, but instead of two dimensions, you see that the volume now is plan and section. And in the corner, you have the double story living room. But what else is different is that these volumes now has a gap in between them. And the gap brings in light and air. The gap allows you to bring in nature, a piece of nature. So in most of these projects, even though they're high density, I try to think of it volumetrically to introduce nature to all the projects. So in this project in 2004, we have 94 apartments, each with their own private pool. So rethinking how amenities can be given privately to each unit. But besides amenities, I thought about the units as a series of houses or dwelling that I shifted to introduce these pools. But this is more than just pools. These are slots that bring in light and air. And the center of the building has an atrium that draws in the air up. Then another project in 2006, this time around, same thing, but every unit on a single floor has a double story living dining room that is flipped alternatively. The idea here is to create a feeling of living on the ground, a feeling of living on a house. So even though it's high density, everybody gets to go outside and get to enjoy a piece of the pool, even though you're in the skyline. What, what creates the feeling of home is the high space and also the, the transitional space between inside and outside. On the ground, as in Corbusier's principles, buildings are raised. They are raised in order to bring nature right through the lobbies. Two other projects to illustrate connecting to nature. One is 21 Anguilla in Singapore, the other one is Savi Avasa in Jakarta. In this project in Singapore, besides fulfilling the brief of a large unit and a small unit, we thought of the units as a stack of six apartments. And then these six apartments can be configured to create these pockets of sky garden that are six stories tall. So now our, our common pool, our gym can be elevated, not necessarily on the ground, but we can bring nature up to the sky. And the way to do that is to think of design in a volumetric sense. 
on the ground, nature is always brought in. We want to blur away the distinction between indoors and outdoors. In Jakarta, we, we were given a beautiful site in the park, Tamawangsa Park, and we thought that these apartments should have a porch that wraps around. Um, then everybody can step out and also protects from the tropical rainstorm that's often found in Jakarta. So you see the brown area is a continuous porch that has been uh, given shade and privacy through these fins and it creates a sense of living outdoors while being protected. And on the ground floor, the same concept holds true. These are sensitive responses to climate in tropical architecture. We could actually see that light, air, space, and uh, connecting with nature are all the key approaches which make your design standing out. But we will also notice that the projects you just shown actually, it's based on where you're based, like Singapore, Malaysia. So could your ideas can be transformed in cities at different regions of the world, like China or other colder, in colder weather part of the world? Yeah. I, I, I believe in the potential of universal architecture. I believe that those ideas can be translated. We have had the opportunity to, to design in Japan, in China, in the US and other temperate climates. For example, in 2016, uh, this project in Tokyo, um, we, we sought to uh, bring the idea of the park. The master plan has this green park. And we wanted to bring the green park upwards. So again, we conceptualized the brief in, in the volumetric sense, and we're able to create these slots. These slots allow us to bring plants up vertically. So every unit gets to enjoy this greenery. And on the upper level, the pool is heated and is uh, climatized indoors. In the summer, panels can be opened up to allow light and air to come true. Uh, we have a project in China too, in Chenzhou, which is the Kangchao project. And in this project, it's the only project that we actually get to try this volumetric approach because after that, the planning regulations change and the double height space created more floor areas. We brought in uh, the idea of multi-generational living where multi families of different generations can live together. You can see in our section, the units are all interlocking. So it's a bit more complex, but it creates very interesting mix of spaces. This is the actual uh, show flat. So then we tested this concept again to a country that uh, has even uh, more uh, colder winters. This is in New York City. Park Lane. Facing Central Park, this is a competition where we are shortlisted to be the last three architects. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be built. They, they shelved the project. But this is the genre of the pencil tower, which is becoming very common in New York. But when a, when, when, when a project is in such a cold climate, we, we, we apply the same principles, but we need to introduce another layer. In this case, between the outside balcony and inside, we created something called a solarium or a sunroom. A sunroom is a space where it collects heat from the southern exposure. And we are able to then introduce the same concept because we have created a zone that's milder. And in the summer months, we can introduce again some of the ideas of the, the water feature and the pool. And 2012, after several attempts of not having my New York projects built, um, I chanced on this opportunity of a site. And I told myself, if I could become the developer, I can commission myself and perhaps I could create a vision that is very pure that I've been trying to do for many, many uh, years. And the difference about this site is that it's not a standalone site with landscape. It fits in into a dense urban environment located next to the High Line and also next to the Hudson Yards. New York planning regulations are very strict and you have to fit all the units into a prescribed volume. But here I've still tested the idea of the, the sky poles and the interlocking units. 
you can see that within this constrained volume, I'm still able to carve eight different types of volumes, like a puzzle, and put it together. And there is a functionality to all these pools also. If you look at it, uh, the building has two exposures. It has a southern exposure and a northern exposure, but the center is dark. So the slot created for the sky pool actually bring in air and light deep into the building. This is uh, the living room. It has a fireplace and has a heated pool. It comes fully fitted out. You can see that that sky pool actually brings light deep into the middle of the building as well. So being the designer and developer, we, we get to actually create a very pure vision and be able to test this vision in a city like Manhattan. So I'm convinced that there is a universality to a good language or architecture. One that's based on humanity rather than just formal expression. One that's based on the human spirit. And even in this project, we created a lot of terraces so you can go outside and appreciate the skyline. So that kind of summarizes, um, perhaps to answer the question that I think is transportable to different countries. So to respond to the surrounding area and to develop your design language and apply it into the universe as a standard rule is quite important. And in Suri Highland project, you are not only the architect, but also developer. And we have lots of developers invited as audience today. And what did you bring to the Surrey High Line with the developer's role that make it so successful? Could you share with, it, with us? I think for every project to work, first of all, I become much more empathetic with the issues of development. I understand development is complex. I'm more empathetic of the developer. Because besides design, there's finance, there's market, there's a lot of other issues. There's authorities, there's timing. Your name and design are very much linked with luxury residential projects. Have you ever encountered with the situation with lower budget, but still could apply your design philosophy? I have, in fact, and, and uh, in 2006, I jumped at the opportunity when the Singapore government uh, asked me to reconceptualize the housing development of Singapore, which is a social housing. As you know, 80% of Singaporeans live in subsidized social housing, and that includes young professionals. When Singapore first became independent, <clears throat> our houses were built very quickly, uh, very densely, uh, and as such, you have a lot of prototypical HDB that looks like this, with surface upper lots um, where the land itself may not be well utilized. So this is a chance for me to see what I can rethink and redo. The other concerns about social housing is that it's not necessarily like private housing, which, which is market driven, where you have to have a lot of features to sell. In, in social housing, you have to start by thinking about people and how people live, things like laundry, do you create a space for them to have laundry? Uh, how do people use the space? When you have a common space, people use it to socialize. It's unprogrammed. People use it to have weddings, and people use it to have funerals. And sometimes you have weddings and funerals next to each other. And they adapt it to have childcare and elderly care. So I realized that the program that we were given, we could reinterpret it to create a new concept. So concept of housing in a park, connectivity to surroundings, and multi-generational living, which is a very important concept. This, this one is about the site. The site looks onto ecological green space. The site is also connected by a linear park, which is an old canal. So when we have this site, I thought that this site should be a continu continuation of nature. Nature should not be interrupted. So conceptually, nature is brought up over the car park and into the sky terrace. So the car park, rather than being on the surface, is tucked under the building, and the entire car park becomes a green hill. We're going to landscape it to make it look like the hill. And I thought, if you had to walk to your car, why do you have to walk inside the car park? Why can't you walk on the outside among the landscape? 
And on the way to the car park, we have a communal roof um, that is on the top of the uh, podium. In this podium alone, we have these air wells where plants actually go into the car park. So you don't need to have exhaust and you don't need to have ventilation. It's a very ecological solution. So even the car park is rethought and it's pleasant. And the fire refuge floors are now landscaped. And we call these sky gardens. There are yoga classes, there's martial art classes. It becomes amenity. And then we thought about all those activities that take place in the social housing. People do have uh, weddings, they do have funerals. Um, you can see that we have dedicated space for amphitheater and funeral. We combine elderly care with a child care center, a coffee shop, um, worship facilities, and gardens. So having this program is important, and separating them in a way that gives them privacy is important, all under one small plot. But the important part is the tower. How do you generate this tower? In Singapore, we have an aging population, and we have multi-generational living. It's already very common that two couples have to work to make income. And they usually drop their kids to their parents in the morning and pick them in the evening, uh, have dinner together. So rather than drive, we conceptualize that they could live together. So the green is the elder studio for the grandparents. They have their own key with the elder facilities and the standard unit is next to it. So as a result of that, we also thought how to build this cheaply. So we created this precast concrete construction and lift it up onto site and stack. It's a clear expression of the unit to the brief. But more importantly, there's a stair that connects these two units and two doors. If two doors are both open, it becomes one unit. So rather than drive, they can just leave the children upstairs, lock the door and go to work. And the government liked the idea very much and made it into a policy. If three families live together, there's subsidies to get a cheaper flat. <clears throat> and even considerations like the laundry and clothes drying, we kept it up to the inside of the building where all the aircon units are located. So the hot air from the air conditioning helps to dry these clothes. We also push for sustainable uh, development. The blue areas collects rainwater that drips down to irrigate all the landscape below. And when water reaches the ground, we have bio swells uh, that filters the water to go back into a storage tank and solar panels on the roof for the public areas. So these are integrations of many things, considerations of uh, the way people live, program and climate. So in a way, I think uh, budget is not an issue because in some ways I like this project because it's very honest and it's stripped down to the bare essentials. And what you see is what you get. So we actually see that even with lower budget, uh, people still could live a qualified life with concerns from designer and architecture like to connecting still the project with the nature and even to consider the small, small details like laundry and uh, architects take the responsibility of building a better home environment. Are you starting to explore and apply your practice into other type of typology such as public space so your design could benefit a larger base of end user? Right, so the answer to that question is really does this methodology of design apply to public buildings and institutions for example uh, in 2011 we won the competition for a design center so when you start with a design center you look at the environment you look at what is given to you in our case we have to restore three conserved buildings from different periods and its location is within the arts district so we realized that on the top, you have the school, the art school, and the bottom, you have the library. So our site is located right in between. So the concept that I could think about to unify these three different buildings is to introduce two courtyards, an enclosed courtyard, an exterior courtyard, and to let these courtyards be open 24 seven, 
to allow students to be able to pass through it. But it is a conservation project after all, and we have to restore the building. But when we restore the building, we made sure to separate the new and the old. And we explored how we could close the atrium. And our concept was really to use a folded plane like origami to create this skyline. And this idea is then carried through to other parts of the building. Here you see the overall space. And I want you to pay attention to the lower level. The lower level actually has doors that pivots so when you open these pivoting doors, it can change the configuration of how space is used. And when you open these doors, the picture on your right shows beyond those doors, there are actually square cubes. And these square cubes can be pushed out to create exhibition pots. And the new addition beyond it, the studios, we lined it with warm wood to have that contrast. We have a chapel that has been uh, converted into the auditorium. So we have used the same origami idea to create this folded ceiling uh, to hide these uh, different requirements. And because it is folded, it helps acoustically as well. And we have created a new staircase to connect with the auditorium. So where we introduced something new, we made it extremely modern. When we restore, we kept to the old features. Even the fire escape staircase becomes a lantern or a beacon in the building. We also won the Singapore Museum competition, which is a historical monument. It used to be an old school. And we are told that we had to introduce very large 2,000 square meter column free space for contemporary art display. It was not easy to introduce such a big space within an old building without destroying the building. So what we did first was to look at the site again and we realized the site is in the middle of the art district. What we do here becomes the heart of the art district. This is where the subways and students will come. It's more than a museum, it's also an educational center. So we looked at the old building and we took away buildings that were added through the years that's not true to the original design. And we switched the entrance. Instead of the entrance being from the front, we introduced the entrance on the side, on Queen Street. We just wanted to contrast old building with this huge 2,000 square meter uh, new addition. And the building across the street is an old school that will be turned into educational facilities. Here we introduced a 700 square meter auditorium and proposed a bridge to link the two. We also proposed to close the road to make it the plaza as the subway stop is here. So this becomes the heart of the art precinct. So again, the generator of this concept is not necessarily what I spoke about for housing, where it's generated by unit time and market. This is generated by urban design and by civic functions. And once the idea is set, um, we go about thinking about how to design in a very simple way as a juxtaposition of contrast with the old building. This is the auditorium addition. And within the museum itself, we made sure that the old parts of the museum is celebrated. It's painted white. Any new addition is in stainless steel. And we could climate control this whole environment without losing the feeling of it being an old building. This is the circulation to the annex building. It's been used also for informal teachings. And a special staircase to lead you to the very top of the 2,000 square foot sky gallery. Now in this sky gallery, you can see the, the historical dome. It's made out of 138 pieces of glass, each 13 meters tall. And they have two different colors. One is clear glass and one is bronze glass. And each of these glass is tilted a few degrees. So if you look at the glass panes, every pane is shifted. What this does is it reflects the dome. It deconstructs the dome. And it's a relationship with new and old, saying that we respect the dome, but we're also changing. It's a reference of the time. But the last project I want to talk about is, to me, interesting. It's never built. We entered a competition which we didn't win. 
but I, I thought that it, it's worth talking about because um, it is a project to commemorate the founding fathers of Singapore. Uh, its founding father is history. And the site is actually in Bay East Garden in Marina Bay, in the park. You know, it's next to a subway and it's in a very prominent site. But the question becomes, how do you start a memorial in a place like Singapore where the founders of Singapore don't like to memorialize themselves in sculptures and statues? So it's, it's not easy to start a project like that where you have to tell the story of the country and also make people feel emotionally drawn to it, to evoke a feeling of pride and sacrifice that came from these leaders. So what, what I've shown here actually was a, a section. This form was derived from the idea of the rain tree. Rain tree is a national tree of Singapore. And in a way, if you look at the reflection, the form is a, a field of engineering. It's very simple. It's a symbol of rain tree. And one of the key uh, quotes that I found was this, a society grows great when men plant trees whose shade in which they know they shall never sit in. The meaning is that people sacrifice for the future generation. And, and I, I thought that this is a very simple statement and I'll plant rain trees all around this monument. It's a simple idea. And when you go to the lower level, you're able to appreciate the strength of rain tree and come under its canopy. And you also know that for every tree of this size, there's foundations in its roots. The roots spread out beyond. And when you actually finish the, the tour of the history, you go into the middle. This is the memorial. This is where space and light will move your spirit and you're awed by, by nature, by the mon monumentality of space. Uh, you take an, uh, a lift or an elevator up and you ended up on the roof. On this roof, you're able to look back and see modern metropolitan uh, Singapore. You, you see the results of the sacrifice. So the journey and the procession takes you up to the top and you're connected back to the current success of the city. I, I thought that a metaphor could also drive design very well. So depending on the type of project, the approach is very different.